Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to Raw Knuckles Podcast. Please like, follow, and subscribe. I'm telling you right now, Tim, you wouldn't go near the fucking net if Larry's standing in front of it. You'd I didn't go near the I didn't go near the net in 2013. <laughs> well, yeah, but of course I wouldn't. <laughs> but not with not with Larry there, that's for sure. Um, Pull him back. Use some you know, like cross check him in front. Yeah, of with this is the wooden sticks too. Is this like oh man? Yeah. I can only yeah. imagine. You could beat up. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down and I never stayed down. And I was vicious, and I was malicious, and I don't care. <laughs> I'm alive. He's a freaking madman. Look at him going to town. Listen, great to see you, and Good I'm so I'm so happy you joined Tim and I today. I appreciate it. Um, I want to get to it. And my first question for you is, why did you always pick on me? Chris, you should know. You're the one that came after me all the fucking time. <laughs> I, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. I, well, I I, you I have to agree. Guy, you were the only guy in that team that had the balls to stick yeah. up for you guys, and I, I'd have to. Did. I'd have to agree with that, and I did go after you a lot. You know, it's it's funny. I used to look for the biggest guy on the other team and want to go after him um, because I figured right. Probably one of the toughest, one. Two, either way, I can't lose. Even if I lose, I can't lose yeah. because I took you on. <laughs> but, um, boy, sometimes I felt like I bit off more than I could chew. I remember I looked at a couple of our fights here recently uh, because you were coming on, and I remember the one in Montreal in front of the net, and I, I hit you probably with two punches in that fight, and you were doing most of the swing, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> I, I can't believe how I, I get out of it. But you used to, boy, you, you could throw me off balance. You had that grip on me, and you just give me one little tug, and, um, and you know, I'd lose my balance. But anyway, um, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about your career and, and certainly Buffalo days and going to L.A. and all that. But um, you uh, grew, up, grew up in British Columbia playing hockey. Did your dad play hockey? Uh, family? Was there anything? Uh, my, dad family? Did, my dad didn't play hockey. My two older brothers did. And one Friday night they were going, the, the season had started and they, my two older brothers were going. I was four or five years old. And I remember making a big stink about I wanted to go to. There was an outdoor rink at the center of town. And that's where everybody was, was going to, to make the different teams that the coaches were at. And uh, I made enough of a stink that I, I, the one thing I, I got all geared up, somebody had the equipment for me and to, to, for the pants to fit, my dad had to take his belt off and it went exactly twice around me and he, he tied <laughs> it up. My pants stayed on the rest of the day. So, um, and then, yeah. So then after that, I just, I, I love the game and just like the rest of us, we played as long as we could. Right. Yeah. And Who were some of like your favorite like teams? What team did you were you a fan of growing up? I was a, you know, and for obvious reasons, Bobby. I I love the Bruins. You know, Bobby Orr was the guy, and I was I was just starting to play hockey, and and maybe one of the better kids on my my team. My my hometown was twenty two hundred people, so there wasn't a lot. Of, there was just enough kids for each, you know, Pee Wee, Bantam, Midget, you know, whatever level we were at. There was just enough kids to make that. So, um, yeah. I, I think most of the kids my age, when we were growing up, wanted to be Bobby Orr. And a lot of them liked the the, the um, Toronto Maple Leafs as well, but but I was a Bruin fan. Well, it certainly uh, suited the style of play. And and I, I guess, you know, I look back on my career, where does everybody always say, where does the fighting come from? Where does that come from? And certainly your career, I didn't go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to be a fighter. You know, I wanted to make it in yeah. the NHL. I wanted to play hockey. Now, I found out pretty soon uh, after I got there that fighting was going to be an avenue for me to really get my foot in the door. But you growing up, obviously playing junior and out West, certainly toughness is a big thing out West. The Western League was known for that. Um, when did that kind of start showing in your game uh, as a young hockey player? That's a great question. Chris, when I was 15... There was a there was a league in in, in northern BC, 
where there was uh, four junior B teams and four senior teams. So the junior B teams were obviously up to 20 years old, and then the, the senior teams were over that. And some of them were, had young kids on them, but most of them were workers in the city or police officers or whatever. They, they just they, they, they formed the team. So there was there was a, there was a, it was an eight team league. And in the town that I played in, Smithers, there was uh, both. There was a junior team and a senior team. And we were playing the senior team our first game one year, and we, we had a bunch of kids. We were, most of us were 15, some 16, and we had some kids from Vancouver. There was this one little right winger, wasn't very big, but this big guy on the senior team took advantage of him. And, and I, the only thing I was, I was just I was just bigger than the little guy, that's all. And so yeah. I stepped in. And uh, and had a scrap with this guy, and I did okay. I didn't beat him or anything, but I did okay. Well, was, you'd have thought I won the Stanley Cup when I came in the dressing room, and <laughs> the next day when I when I went to the rink, the rink manager came over and was patting me on the back and stuff. And so 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 sticking up for a teammate was a big deal. I didn't realize how big a deal it was. And just like you, that was a that was an avenue for me to kind of move on through my career, and and ultimately was you know I got drafted in 78 and the flyers were a big thing back then remember the broad street bullies and so teams were teams were taking players that played like i did higher in the draft because they wanted some quote unquote toughness and and i think that's that's was an avenue like i said to to get me there and do you did you do you did you like fighting did you have fear like were you pretty comfortable i didn't tim but when i was young i was a hothead my brothers used to used to make fun of me because I'd get pissed off so fast. I didn't I didn't like fighting, but it was a way for me to to get some of that energy out. And uh, and I, I didn't go looking for fights. Chris used to have to come and ask me if I wanted to fight, and then <laughs> go. But um, but Tim, it was uh, it was it was for sure an avenue and something I knew that would help me get get to where I wanted to go. That's funny. <clears throat> I get. I, I didn't have that reputation. I played college. I fought in the streets and all that stuff growing up. But we drafted the same year, Tim. You know, uh, Larry, thirteenth overall. Me, two hundred thirty-one. So that tells you how th- how tough they thought I was. <laughs> but um, you know, that draft. It's funny. We, you drafted thirteenth overall, first round pick, and um, just looking at today. Say the draft is coming up two days from now. Yeah. Where do you think you'd be drafted today? Oh, I'm late. I'm 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 two thirty three. I'm late. <laughs> they, 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 do you think you play? Not, you could play in today's game. You think? I not not with the skills that I had. I don't think so, Tim. I mean, you may play in the game. Maybe these kids are the the game. Crazy. The game's gotten so much better. The, the, the equipment's better to begin with. The skates are lighter. The sticks are lighter. Every stick is, you know, if you order a, a curve this way or that way or so much weight, the, the, the sticks are all, everything's consistent now. And then the skills these kids have is amazing. So, yeah, I, if you drop me in the world today of the NHL, I don't make anybody's team. Yeah, it's really, <clears throat> it's really hard to... Um, put you know, put a finger on that because honestly, I think could I have played today? And you know, for me, I I think the biggest thing would have been the skating. Could I skate? You know, because honest to God, Larry, when I was playing and you were playing, it was it was fast. It, yeah. I mean, it was the fastest game really out there. And I know looking at it today, can you imagine? If there was no red line back when we played, oh my god! Right? Oh like, my god! Yeah. I would have like ch- past the blue line. I would have waited on our blue line for you guys to come back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but so you, you play junior in Portland, uh, pr- pretty tough team, good team. What was it like going away from home the first time? You're in BC. You're heading down. You got to obviously live with a family. What was that experience like being a young kid from? from BC and then heading over the border for the first time. Well, I, I left home when I was 15. So that was, so I'd already kind of had that experience. And then I went down when I was 16, 17 to the lower mainland down by Vancouver. And I played in, in Langley for two years down there. And I was traded that summer 
to the the Edmonton Oil Kings. The Edmonton Oil Kings were the first team to move to the States, and they became the Portland Winterhawks. So we were the first group of kids that, that were playing in the Western Hockey League out of a U.S. city. And uh, that was fun. It was I, I didn't know any of those kids when I got there. I was – and so – you know, I, I was fighting some of my teammates in Canada. I didn't know who, but I just, I just figured, you know what? This is, I got the one shot. I'm not going to, usually I never fought in training camp. I figured, you know what? These guys are going to be my teammates and I'll fight. But that, that was the one time I said, I got to put all the cards on the table. So some of the guys that were Paul Mulvey and Perry Turnbull and Dave Hoyt and some of these guys. So we get through training camp. And I ended up making the team, and and uh, and that, what a wonderful trip that was! That was that was a lot of fun. There was some really good guys in that team. Um, you know, we, so we, that that whole league. Sorry, like that whole league at that time. Every team was tough in the Western League, right? Then they, they, they all have fighters, right? They had two or three scrappers. Like we, and we, they were all like your size, like big, big. Or there was a lot, fighters. like like in New Westminster had Barry Beck and. And uh, he was just – did you play with Barry? In, in I played the against him. I yeah. played against him. Yeah, I fought him. Tim, every team had had tough guys. Um, some some teams had – Victoria had a bunch of tough kids on it. Um, it's just how, that's just how they built the teams back then, you know? And when Chris opened up about you guys fighting a little bit, I was going to ask you, like, do you prefer <laughs> to fight a guy more your size or is it – you know, you like picking on guys like Chris. <laughs> Chris let's make this perfectly clear. Chris picked on me. No, I, I, I preferred not to fight, honestly, but I was one of the bigger guys on our team anyway. So whoever was stirring the pot on the other team was who I had to go have a conversation with, you know, Tim. Yeah, you know, and, and it's right. You weren't a guy that went around looking for it. You played physical, you played hard, you played tough, but you didn't go around like trying to find guys like some guys did, like myself at times, but um, which again, credit to you. Um, so you, you, you Tim, get out Tim, of junior. I, I, I'm in LA and we're playing a game against the Canadians and Chris falls into me, not his fault, just falls into me, tears my knee up, they, carry me off the ice and I was done for the season. I didn't come back until the start of the next year. I had an ACL and I was living in an apartment with my wife at the time. And probably eh, a week, 10 days later, I get this call from a guy with a Boston accent. No idea who the hell it is. He says, Larry, it's Chris. Just call him to apologize for tearing your knee up. I said, seriously, who is this? No, Larry, it's really, it's me. It's Chris. And I thought, you know what? He could have, he didn't have to make that phone call. He, he could have just, because it, it wasn't his fault. I looked at it a couple of times on, he fell into me. And uh, when he called the other day and asked me if I'd come on the show, I said, you know what? Because Chris Nyland had the courage or the decency to call and check in on me 30 years ago, I'm going on the show and checking in with him. There you go. I'm grateful for that phone call, Knox. You probably don't even remember it. You yeah, remember? I do. And I, <laughs> I'm I kidding, appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate I you saying that. I, I, I still don't know to this day how you got my phone number. It, it wasn't back you in cell phone. It was, it was the, on the wall. I forget how I got it, to be honest with you. I don't know if I got it through RIP or it's somebody in the organization. Uh, because, you know, I just remember it happened. I was with the Rangers at the time. And I was you were coming up the wall with the puck, and I went to hit you. And the ice is so bad in the fucking L.A. forum. I I wiped out and fell. And I went right into you. And when I saw you hurt, and because I always, even though we fought, I always had the respect for guys I fought. I did, um, yeah. and I felt so bad after that because I didn't mean it. I wanted wanted you to know that. And I I'm like, did I end his career? Because it was bad, right? You had a, a pretty severe injury. So I I want I wanted you to know that not. I wasn't going to call and kiss your ass so you wouldn't beat me up the next time. I just want <laughs> you to know that it, I didn't mean to do it, and I was wishing you the best. But that's I'm glad you remember that. That's cool. Um, but so you go off to Buffalo from Junior before we get to L.A. Um, and 
were you happy being drafted by Buffalo when you got there? I mean, let's face it. You're still there. You love the city. But like everybody in the NHL, they say, what cities do you like hate going to in the NHL? They always say Winnipeg and Buffalo. But Buffalo gets a bad rap because it is a good city. But you get there the first time. What was that like for you? Young I, kid? I didn't know where the Buffalo. I get drafted. I don't know. I, I mean, I knew who the Sabres were, but I didn't know where the city was. So I look on the map. And you know, you know what's funny? Before the draft, I've been – I've been. Remember, they had the WHA how, how they had their draft. They would they would give yep. me a list. They would give they would they they pick six players. The year the, the year seventy eight seventy nine the year I got drafted. They picked six players. Each team would pick six players, so you could be drafted by three or four teams. Six if you're really good. And I had been drafted by Edmonton, Houston, and Winnipeg. So. So we went and visited Houston, went and visited Edmonton, and then Winnipeg. And then I got an offer from Ted Sather to, like, for a contract to come and play for the, for the Oilers. Now, they were still in the WHA. And he called me the night before the NHL draft and said, Larry, and, they, and they'd given me a sizable offer. It was, it was, it was nice. He said, Larry, listen, you're never going to get drafted in the NHL. Why don't you sign the deal? And... I, I didn't have anybody to talk to. I didn't have friends that had done an what I, I didn't. I had an agent, but he he was, yeah. He, didn't he was know. signed it so I could make some money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I said to my mom, I said, Mom, and, and, and Sather said, you've got until 12 o'clock tonight to make the make your decision. If I don't hear from you, I'm going to assume you're not going to sign it for us. So I said to my mother, I said, Mom, what should I do? She said, well, you always wanted to play in the NHL. Why don't you see what happens tomorrow? So the draft was in, was in Montreal that year. And so a three-hour time difference between Montreal and, and Fort St. James. And uh, the phone rang at 7.30, and I was downstairs sleeping. And my mom yells down in the basement. She goes, Larry, the phone's for you. So I come upstairs, and it was my agent, and I'd been drafted by Buffalo. And... Again, I, I, I knew who the Sabres were. I knew they had the French connection. I knew they were a really good team. But now I'm now I'm thinking in the back of my head is Glenn Sather going, you're never going to get drafted. And I'm going, well, maybe I got drafted, but maybe I'm still not good enough to make that team. Maybe I should maybe I should go back to Sather. At least he thinks I can make his team. As it turned out, I'm, I'm happy I, I, it went the way it did. I got sent to the minors early my first year for probably oh, three months or four months, and then I got called up. Are you so in Buffalo sl- now? Do you live in Buffalo? Yeah, I do. Well, I was going to ask, like, you know, Chris, you mentioned before, uh, you know, like when Chris was, he never wanted to leave Montreal. He lives in Montreal now. Um, it's kind of similar to your situation. Is that what you felt like, right? How early you know what, you want to call? So, so, yeah. so I, I knew I wasn't. So when I grew up at home, you, you your parents were either worked in the mine or they worked in the sawmill or the logging business. Or in my case, with my dad, he was the he had worked in in the sawmill business, and then towards the end of his career, he he was working for the town as a supervisor, you know, water, sewer, sidewalk, stuff like that. Um, but so I knew I wasn't going back home. There was there wasn't there wasn't going to be a, something I wanted to do back there. So so I made Buffalo. My, I married a girl from here, a Canadian girl who actually had moved down to the states. Married her, and and our kids grew up here, and. It, I've heard that, Chris, from a dozen guys, how, how terrible, because you fly into Buffalo, the airport, and then ride from the airport to the arena is shit. And you get downtown and it's more shit. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. when was the last time they built a new building here? You know, it's, it's, it, it, it is that. But um, it's, it's a wonderful place to raise kids. It's, a, it's been a wonderful place for, for me to stay. And, and I'm, you know, from Toronto, we're an hour and a half, Tim, so if we want to scoot, out west to see my folks, I can get to the airport in Toronto or Hamilton and fly WestJet or Air Canada home. So it's for me. For me, it worked out perfect. I'm happy to that I, that I got dropped by the Sabers and, and I've made it my home. I always joke around. I say Buffalo's a city they forgot to finish. Guys were building it. They sat down for lunch one day, looked around, and said, "Ah, let's get out of here. This ain't gonna work." <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I want to go back to. <clears throat> Slats, and if you don't mind, 
um, sharing that sizable offer with us because okay. compared yeah. to the dollars today, I want to know what was sizable back then. Because <laughs> now, so so I, I had a 52 Ford pickup that I was putting a new engine in out of a friend of my dad's shop. So one day he called, tried to call me and he, and he couldn't get a hold of me. He, he called my mom and my mom said he's out at the shop working on his, on his truck. So Sather calls the agent and goes, what the hell's going on with this kid? How come I can't get a hold of him? And he says, well, you know, he's, he's working on his truck. He's doing what he says. You tell him we'll put a new car in the deal. Okay, so they're going to put a new car in the deal. The, the deal was going to be $400,000 for three years. Right. And, 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 uh, and a Canadian, but still the time, Canadian and U.S. dollar. At the, at the time, time, that's big money. Yeah. So I, I was... And I didn't, and honestly, I didn't make that much when I got over to the Sabres. I, I made uh, about 300000 over three years. So it was, it was 100000 less for my first deal when I got here. But, um, yeah, I, and, and I just, Chris, I, I worked in the sawmill in the summertime. So that summer I, I was working in the, in the sawmill until the draft. I was making five thirty-five an hour, and so... Four hundred thousand dollars waved in front of my face was a lot of dough, and I thought maybe I should take this. But I'm glad I waited. Yeah, it's funny you didn't, but and you're glad you waited. But in hindsight, looking back, did you ever think, geez, if I went to Edmonton, I'd have rings on my fingers? Yeah, no, Chris, and that's the one thing I regret. Anybody who's played in the game that doesn't have <clears throat> what you got, I'm sure regrets that. They, you know what? They yeah. drafted my brother in '83. My brother played in Portland, and they drafted him. In '83, and he played a few games with the Oilers, but no, I, I, that, that, those thoughts have crossed my mind. You know, shit. If I just would have signed with the yeah. Oilers, and then they came into the league, you know, shoulda, woulda, coulda, right? It's funny. Like I think of that. <clears throat> now it worked out for me because I was certainly I'm grateful I was part of a championship team. But when I look back at my career, I was drafted same year as you, '78. I stayed in school one more year. If I'd never won a cup, listen to this. So I stay in school that year. The Habs win four in a row. If I had left, I have a shot at at least getting there, right? Yeah. yeah. And then <clears throat> if we don't win in 86, 92 comes. I go back to Montreal, and I want to sign and stay in Montreal. You know, I come home. I got that jersey on. I wanted to play one more year, 92, 93. They win the Stanley Cup, the Habs. Yeah. So but the tail end, the beginning and the tail end of my career, if I never won one and didn't get, you know, I'd kick myself, how come I didn't leave school yet earlier? Why did I retire? You know, like I would have been scratching my head on that one. But, again, I was, I'm fortunate to have been part of a, a team that won it. And I, I really mean that because, you know, and up here, Larry, you know, walk around. People say, how many cups you got? I'll go one. They go, only one? I'm like, fuck you, <laughs> only one. Fucking if you know what I did to get that one, right? Yeah. Like some of these yeah. guys up here, they got four, they got five. You know, Henry had I, 11. Like it's I, crazy. I, I played with Jill Perot, right? I played a bunch of years with Jill Perot, no Stanley Cup. I played with Marcel Dion out in L.A. for two years, no Stanley Cup. Like there's a bunch of amazing hockey players that have played our great game that never got a sniff, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Would I have traded some of that? For, for sure, I would have. You know? Speaking of Stanley Cups, what was it like? Because uh, he has a bunch of them. What was it like playing for Scotty Bowman? Scott, Scott, when Scotty first got here, Scotty was with Roger Nielsen. So Scotty was, Scotty was the hammer, and, and uh, Roger was kind of like the, the mom that took care of all yeah. the problems and make sure things were good. And, and the way it went, it worked best when Scotty was running the games and Roger would run the practices. Things worked best. But every now and then, Scotty would come out on the ice and everything would just go to shit when Scotty was on the ice because he would start <laughs> screaming and barking and, and uh, pissing people off. And, and it, it, he was a tough guy. And during the game, he was a wizard. He, 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 he would be two or three lines ahead of the next guy and knowing, knowing what he wanted to get out on the ice and, and stuff like that. But in practice, he was, he was tough. 
the bigger issue I think here in Buffalo was when they brought Scotty on board, they made him the general manager and the head coach. And I think and this is the only place he was a GM and it was the only place that he never won a cup. Cause then he went from here, he went to Pittsburgh, won a cup, went to Detroit, won a cup, went to Chicago as a advisor. I think he was supervisor and he won yeah. two or three cups there. Yeah. He certainly uh, has an amazing record. Uh, Scotty Bowman. I remember first time I came to Habs locker room, that four in a row, I had been drafted and I came up for a playoff game <clears throat> and they left me tickets. Here's a, here's a first round pick story for you. They left me tickets for a game up here. They had to look in the guidebook to see if I was the guy I was, see if I was drafted by them. Cause I went to see when I was in Boston, I went down to the locker room. I said, Hey, I want to go to the game uh, next game in Montreal. Uh, I was drafted by you guys. So Howard Grumman, he picks up the book and he looks, what's your name? I said, Chris Dion. He looked, he said, oh yeah, we'll leave you tickets. So I go up there with a buddy of mine. We drive up. I go to the box office, uh, tickets for Chris Dion. Sure, they come out. That'll be $270. I'm like, no. Hey, you sh-? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they left me tickets. <laughs> I had to pay for them. Anyway, Ron Caron at... Uh, after the game, he, he sent somebody up in the third period to grab me and bring me down to the locker room and introduced me to, they had beat the Bruins that night. He introduced me to a couple of players and Rod Langway, cause he's a Boston guy. And then he introduced me to Scotty. He says, uh, Ron says, Scotty, uh, this is uh, Chris Nyland, uh, draft pick of ours. And Scotty looks at me, goes, can you play defense? I said, I'll play anywhere you want me to. That's the first question he asked me. And that's all he kicked. Can you play defense? And I'm like, uh, what, what do you say? I just said, I'll play anywhere you want me to. And then he went off to Buffalo. But um, so your, your career in Buffalo, some, certainly some good teams there. I remember those games, playing in that little bond. That must have been conducive to your game, no? It was, it was good for right. me, Chris. Being in that building was really fit, fit my game well. Um, and... And and Boston was the same way, right? Boston had the small right. ring, so uh, I enjoyed those games. I, I love playing there because boy, you could get hit, right, Tim? You go into the glass, the glass would like lean like three rows back into the stage, <laughs> and you come back out, and you're like, woo, <laughs> you know, it's like a trampoline. But um, yeah, there was some tough games in there, not a lot of room. Um, Good fan base, love the team. Chicken wings were awesome. Rick uh, Jenner it was all you know. Rest yeah, in peace, Rick Jenner, right? I mean, or Jenner, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was the guy. Matter of fact, didn't didn't he attribute uh, something about the cookies in the top corner? A goal you scored top corner once. What, what what's the story on that with Rick? Top shelf where Mama hides the cookies. <laughs> where Mama hides the cookies. Yeah, that, he, he he gave me credit for that, and I. And I I take it. I'm not sure I'm, I should, but <laughs> who's going to argue now? He said it. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm like blown away. I, t- I say that to my son. He's eight. I always say that when he scores and he's like, where are you, why are you saying that? I'm like, it's not from an announcer, but the, you're the guy. That's all right. I'm going to take it. That is funny. I met the, the, where mama hides the cookies guy. I met him. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some of your teammates and we'll talk, I want to talk a little bit about that, but um, one of them, Lindy Ruff. Okay. Yeah. Did and you everybody play with used to, Rangers? huh? Did you play with Lindy with the Rangers? Oh yeah, I did. That's why I brought him up because I got to tell you, you know, the joke with Lindy was uh, Lindy at home, rough, no, rough at home, Lindy on the road. Okay, that was a joke on him. But I'll never forget. And when I play with him, I'm telling you, I never laughed so hard in my life. This guy's one of the funniest guys I ever played with. But I fought him a few times. And I remember one night I had fought him. Uh, and when I went in the penalty box, and he did, it, we had F you, F you, stupid shit, you know? And I actually said, by the way, I want to send my condolences to you and your family. Seriously, not uh, oh, when, about when losing brother. his brother. I'll never yeah. forget when he lost his brother in the bus accident. His brother played junior, Tim, and Lindy uh, – it, yeah, he passed during the season. It happened, and uh, I remember saying that to Lindy, and he never forgot it. We talked in New York uh, about it, and just what a gr- was he a, a great teammate or what? Huh? 
he was a lot of things. He was a great team. The first year we, we played together, I had to go into the end of the season and I had my nose was all messed up. I, I couldn't breathe out one side of it, so they had to break some stuff and fix it. He played the whole season with an 18-inch rod in his in his femur that they that he broke his leg the year before in junior. And he was just he's the toughest guy I've ever played. Him and Mike, I, I put Mike Ramsey right behind him, but he would he played hurt. Injured. None of us knew the whole season. Now he had to go back in the hospital, and they had to take that steel pin out of his leg somehow. I don't know how the hell they did it, but yeah. And, and so toughness, and then comical and funny, and oh, he 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 kept it light. He was he was the consummate teammate. He was so cool in New York. We go there. We couldn't wait to get to the airport to go on the road because he would always get the ten dollar bill and tie it to the uh, dental floss. And I'm telling you, <laughs> we, he would, we'd all be sitting there waiting for the plane because we fly a commercial back in that day. Uh -huh. And people would be walking, they'd see it and he'd yank it, right? <laughs> and we got the whole team laughing. And then one guy <laughs> caught him, he was watching it. And the guy's walking along, he looked down and he stepped on it. And Lindy just starts booing him. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> the guy, Grab the 10 bucks and put it in his pocket. The, then we got the whole section booing the guy. And it was all Lindy Ruff. I, oh, God. So one, he's one had time, a great. One yeah, time we're, go ahead. We're, we're, we're at the airport in Seattle and he's doing the same thing. And he borrowed $5 from McKegney. And oh. so he, he got the $5 out there and it's going, it's tricking everybody for probably 20 minutes. Everybody has a good chuckle. And then finally, he just lets the next guy pick it up. And McKegney was pissed off. He chases the guy <laughs> off. No, I found the money on the floor. I'm not giving it back to you. <laughs> Tony didn't like that. Oh. No. If you're like me and you're going to play some golf this summer, you have to check out this hidden gem. Windmill Heights sits atop the beautiful hills in Notre Dame de Il Perot. They have affordable rates and they offer customized membership opportunities for all levels. If you want to book a tea time, call 514-453-7177. Hit them straight. If you love your pet like I love my St. Bernard Adele, you'll want to feed them a balanced, biologically appropriate raw diet. The reason I've chosen Formula Raw is because all blends of their food are locally sourced and they consist of exclusively human-grade meat and organs, as well as fruits and vegetables. And all products used a hormone and antibiotic free. So like I said, if you love your pet like I love Adele, you choose Formula Raw. Make sure you go to formularaw.com and use the promo code RAWNUX at checkout to receive 10% off your first order. That's RAWNUX, R-A-W-K-N-U-X. So um, I'm, I, I don't know, and I maybe I should have done my research, but were you there when Clint Malachuk got hurt? I was. I was. I no. was I was injured that night. I was up in the um, press box. No, I watched that today, and I've talked to Clint a few times. I'm going to have him on, by the way, and I've read his book. But um, how, how like, like I've seen some injuries. I, I've seen uh, Tory Robertson broke his leg right in front of our bench, and his bone was sticking out of his oh, shit. His, no, it was crazy. It was pushing out of his, his socks. And this kid, he was a tough bastard. Yeah, he was. This kid got up on his own and wanted to, he want, he got up on his own and, he, and finally he put his arm on the shoulder of a teammate and went off the ice. I was like, oh, oh, sick to my stomach. But that Clint Malachuk thing, and I watch it, I've, I've watched it like within the last year. I've sh I showed it to someone. How gruesome was that in person and how close to death? What a, and, and the guy who saved his life, right, Rip? Yeah, uh, Jim Pizzatelli. Tell the story there, if you can. So, so, so first of all, it happens at the, at, the saber, at, the, at the end of the ice where you come on the ice. Remember the dressing rooms, the two dressing rooms, you walk out parallel. It happens at that end, which probably is the biggest reason why, why Clint made it through that. But, but the, the skate came through, cut his throat, and then there was just, and he went down and there was a pool of blood everywhere in front of him, in front of the crease. And, and the, uh, the trainers got out on the ice right away, opened the door and got out on the ice right away. 
And one of them was smart enough to, to, to pinch off the, the blood flow. Um, and they got him back in the dressing room and they got him to the hospital quick. So Mike ran or Mike Felino and I, after the game, I went down to the dressing room. And like I said, I wasn't, I didn't play that night. So I grabbed Michael. I said, let's, let's go over and see how Clint's doing. By the time we got to the hospital, uh, he was, you know, he was with it, coming around, talking to people and stuff. But, um, that was a, oh, that was a scary night. Boy, it crept up on him later in life, right? That PTSD yeah. stuff is real, right? When, you yeah, know, good for him for coming out and talking about it because I think that's that's helped a lot more than just him. I mean, I think it helps. Oh him yeah, for sure. But I think for sure, it does. And they played. They conti- They finished the game right after that. That yeah, had to be like, oh man, that's yeah. right. The video. Yeah. They might not do it today, but they did then. They scraped up the ice and cleaned up the blood. And- right. Yeah. Wow. That again. That. Uh, having Rip there, right? Rip's a Vietnam vet, right? Was that? Jim, Jim, Jim Pizzatelli is the Vietnam vet. Oh, Jim. That's who I meant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he, and he, uh, he was there, and, and the, the doctors were close enough by that once pizza got him off the ice, they were there to, to take over. Yeah, him. well, good. I'm I'm glad for Clint today, for sure. He's doing he's doing Honestly. well, and he's helping others, too. Um, You know, I want to talk a little bit about your bro. Again, drafted after you. First rounder, he's drafted 20 overall. Do you think um, your reputation helped him and hurt him? Or I, th- I think he was a much better hockey player than I was. He could play the power play. He had a really good shot, um, better skater, uh, just all around better. I-, I think a better hockey player. Maybe not as as mean. Maybe maybe not as mean, but. Um, and I think the Oilers drafted him, hoping they would get a little bit of that in him, and and, and they didn't. And he went on to play for Edmonton for a little while, a little while, and then went to Chicago and played there for a bit. Then he then he ended up going to the Chicago's farm team, the Indianapolis Ice, and ultimately got into coaching, and uh, and then and actually still coaching to this day. He's coaching right now for the Prince George uh, Cougars in the Western Hockey League. So. Good, really good kid. Yeah, I played against him when he was in Abbotsford as the coach there. But, I mean, he definitely had some anger in him, right? One of the best <laughs> meltdowns behind the bench I've ever seen, anyone's ever seen. Have you seen that, Chris? <laughs> yeah, what did, you, what did you think of that when you saw your bro? I mean, listen, here's the deal. I don't think there's a person out there in the world that at their job, they wish they could have done something like that at some point. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure. And, and he, I, I talked to him a day or two later and I just said, just walk me through what happened. And there was a, it, it was, it was a, any coach would have got pissed off about what happened because the, the call didn't go against his player, but it went against the next time it happened uh, against his team. It went against their play. And so it was, it logically, it made sense to me when he would explain it to me. Why he got yeah. so pissed off and threw his, you know, ripped his jacket off and stuff like that. It just, he was having fun with it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. Uh, Same here. Same here. Um, so um, you think it might have, uh, that reputation, the expectation for him to be like you kind of hurt him a little bit? I think it hurt him. And I think had he gone to another team other than Edmonton, things probably would have been different. Um, you know, he, he's, yeah. he, like I said, he, he, he's a, Better hockey player than I was. He, he'd chew up more minutes. He could play the power play for you, um, and, and 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 you know, on the, on the on the right team, that would have worked just fine. But cool. I, I think Sailor wanted someone who was a little more like his older brother, and and then that's just my opinion. If you ask Jim, he might give no, you. No, I hear you. I hear you. Um, the uh, not to get back on the fighting, but I uh, that was a part of it. Um, when you look back and look at all those fights you had, <clears throat> Semenko once said you were the only guy that ever hurt him. What was like for you, like some of the tougher bouts you had? Maybe someone you had a tougher time to deal with than others. One of the toughest fights I ever had was was one of my first fights, and it was right in Long Island. We were playing the Islanders, and. Uh, Bobby Nystrom smacked Rick 
Martin over the head with a stick on the way off the ice. They were, the benches were right beside each other. And as he was coming off the ice, he whacked him. And, and Jerry Korab was there, Lee Foglin, uh, Jim Schoenfeld. And I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to do something. Nobody did a fucking thing. So the next time I got on the ice, I challenged, I challenged them. And, uh, and I got my ass kicked. <laughs> but I, 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 I didn't, I didn't care. I thought at least you're not going to do sure. that. Or, or if you, if you want to do it again, I'm going to do that again too. And I might, you might kick my ass again, but you're not going to be hit, whacking Mick, Rick Martin or any of my teammates over the head with a hockey stick. That's not going to happen. So that, that was, that was what, that's why I did what I did. Um, I, I, I met Bobby sometime later, 20 years later, 25 years later, and we were we were getting interviewed together on a on a, uh, a Buffalo radio station, and we talked about just what we just talked about, and uh, and uh, he was trying to be the nice guy and stuff. I said, Bobby, cut the bullshit. I said, you kicked my ass. He goes, No, I didn't. He says, I said, You did because I didn't finish the game. I I my eye was all puffed shut, and then I couldn't see out of my other eye. I said, I was. Toast. He goes, Well, I had to go the next morning to her to read to some kids out in some nursery school. And he said, both of my eyes were black and the kids were looking at me like something was wrong with me. So it was, <laughs> it was kind of funny, oh. but no. And, and you know who else gave me a tough time was, was uh, Jimmy Mann. I, I don't know if you ever fought Jimmy Mann. And, no, and, almost in Quebec, but it got broken right. up. He had that big punch, right? The one big but, left. But he had a left hand punch. And, and, yeah. And, I, I, I was kicking his ass one night in Winnipeg, just feeding him his lunch, and then he threw a, he threw a left hook straight above his head and hit me right in the beak. I, I know it's a big target. Hit me in the beak, and there was freaking blood all over the place. But yeah. uh, well, were you pretty funny. calm? Were you pretty calm on game days, or would you be like looking at who you're playing and, and nervous about that? Well, Tim, when I went into Boston. Most of the time, but when I went into Boston or Philadelphia, you know how you go for your pregame skate, come back, have a bite to eat, lay down for a couple hours, and yeah. then go. To the couple hours that I laid down, I fought everybody in the Boston Bruins at least twice. By the time I woke up again, I was well geared up, wound up, and so when I, by the time I got to the rink, I was I was calm, but not during the day. The, you know, the anticipation of what you and it, it was always worse, right, Chris? It was always worse. What you thought was was going to happen, and what and, really happened, right? Yeah, it, it always, the apprehension. You always conjure up this other bullshit in your head. And, yeah, well, it's funny. People ask me that too, and that for me, I slept great in the afternoon. I knew what was coming, but I could sleep really. I slept really good, sound. But when I woke up, that's when it turned on for me. I had to get out of the house or get out of the hotel and go right to the rink. I couldn't wait around. I had to get that. Then I got really started getting focused. And I, I think we all, in our own way, uh, you know, some of us deal with it the same way, some different. But uh, I think for the most, again, the most part, I love doing my job. Um, but certainly I had the apprehension. I had the anxiety before games, you know. I, I, you know, I, anybody who says they didn't is full of shit, I think. I, I said you to know? Jimmy Jim Jim Schoenfeld one day, so we were talking about this in late class that we were at training camp. And I said, show me. I, I said, I get all tense up and worked up and aggravated, you know, thinking about, I said, well, what does a guy like Bobby Mongrain do? Are, they, are these, you know, J.F. Fr Fr Frankie Sobe and these young kids that, Brent Peterson, what, what the heck, what, the, what like, I can handle guys myself. that aren't known as fighters, yeah. I, I can handle myself, and I'm scared shitless. What are these guys? He goes, they don't... <laughs> doesn't treat them like that you know they, right? don't, they don't treat it like that they and you could see it right like i i you know a lot of people they 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 had the knock on fighting i you know we don't like fighting in the game this and that but boy you know sitting in the locker room in boston before a game of philly you can look around the room and see what teammates are nervous right everybody's got it on edge but you can tell the guys who there's some guys who have legitimate legitimate fear yeah. uh, about going out there and somebody doing something to him. You, yeah. you can see it, right? Yeah. yeah. You and think that, that's gone in today's game? 
I do, Tim. I, I, I don't think that exists anymore. I, I mean, how many fights would there be in a year now? Would there be a dozen? And then, and I, yeah. and I, the game's great. I don't, don't. I'm not saying what I did. I, I'm, I, I'm proud of my career, and I, I wouldn't change a fucking thing. Like I'm good with everything I did, but um, I don't think these kids. I don't. I, I think that's something they, they don't have to worry about anymore. They just take it off their brain and put it over there. And if there, if there's a fight, it's rare. With us, yeah. there, was a, there was a fight at least every night. Yeah, every night. How, how about that Adams yeah. division back in the day, right? Oh my God. Oh my God. Right? Yeah. Boston, Buffalo, Montreal, Quebec, Hartford. Hartford. Like, like yeah, every night there was, it, it was cr crazy, crazy. How about the brawls? Like, I've been in a few. Um, NHL ones, American League. I was in Maine, a couple. I hated them. We were in the um, brawl to end all brawls with Philly with Dave Brown, no shirt on. Um, that one. Um, how about you in the brawls? What when you look back? I hated them. I hated them because because that that's when someone really could get hurt in the brawl. Someone could sucker yeah. somebody, or someone could step on somebody's hands with their skate, and and there's nothing anybody could you know the referees couldn't stop it because there was too many of us scrapping. So I, I was only ever in two, one in junior and one in, in the American League. Yeah. Are you guys, in, in that situation, like, are you both, look? are you trying to mediate it at all? Or are you just, <laughs> like, ready to, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like it, like you said, it sounds like it would be a shitty situation. Just like, I'll just say what? for me, yeah, I would always look for the toughest guy because I didn't want him ending up with someone else. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I, I would think you're the same, Larry. I, I would have done that, or if one of our, if I, and I'm the worst guy, then then I'm the guy you don't want. Because if one of our superstars or one of our better players is getting beat up by the tough guy, then I want to make sure that I take him out. And yeah. so now you got a two-on-one situation, and, and that's that's that just makes the brawl worse. Did you um, ever cross paths with Dave Brown? I don't think I ever fought Brownie. Brownie, yeah, I, I was just wondering if you did. Um... We had him on uh, a few months back, and uh, what a what a sweetheart of a guy he is! I couldn't believe. Like I've heard, I've uh, heard things about him. Yeah, he's a good man. And again, most of those guys are good. I look at you certainly. Um, you know, most of the tough guys, and you look at their records, but they they always have that connection with the fans. You know, as much as anybody on the team. And a lot of tough guys are guys that give back, like you do in Buffalo. Um, but though all those years in Buffalo, and um, you end up getting traded in 85, 86 to the Kings. Now, and I'll just say, when I got traded, it almost broke me. I was so – I don't know how guys do it. Like Brent Ashton, right? He played on like 10 teams in fucking 12 years. I'm like, how the hell you do that? I – I was devastated. How about you when you went to LA? Uh, we, we were on a week long road trip, uh, playing our last game in Winnipeg. Uh, at the end of the game, uh, I, I I get called up into the room. You've been traded to LA, and you're going to stay here for three days or four days because LA was coming in. And back then, when LA would go to Winnipeg, they'd play two games. They'd play. Friday, Sunday, or whatever, whatever there would be a day between. So, so they were the next team coming in. So, we waited there, and I cried like a freaking baby. I, I was devastated to to have left. But, you know, it wasn't met met, met some of the guys. I, I got traded with another teammate too, Sean McKinnon. So that made it a little bit easier because we were both there together. Um, so that 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 made life a little bit easier for the three or four days. And then once the rest of the players came in, they, they treated us good. They were, they were, it was a good, good group of guys to be around, you know. We're all living there. Did that take some time? And it'd be completely it, different to Buffalo. It did, but I, but I was single or I, I married, I mean, with no kids. And so we lived not too far from, from the rink. The rink and the, and the, uh, the practice rink weren't too far apart. The form and the practice rink weren't too far apart. And, Traffic, you know, you're going to the game in the middle of the afternoon and coming home late at night, so you weren't dealing with the bullshit traffic they have out there. So it wasn't bad. And then, you know, it was, the sunshine was nice. 
You know, it's all right. Uh, always a nice warm day in LA. That was good on the bones. Um, and then, you know, you spent, uh, what, well over three years there. And then, uh, you come back to, they couldn't afford both. They they couldn't afford both me and Gretzky. So they sent me back to LA. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, the Gret stays in LA and you go back to Buffalo. How, um, how gratifying was that for you? That was nice. It was, and I probably had, I think I came back, I had two years left in my career and I probably played, I messed my back up late that year. So honestly, I probably played another 50 games that, that, that mattered, but it was nice to come back to Buffalo. It was, it was I mean, I, I came back here in the summer anyways. My wife's family was from here, like I said earlier. So it made sense to come back to Buffalo when I was done playing. The fact that they traded me back here just made it a little bit easier. <clears throat> and during these during this time, these last couple of years, were you kind of getting sick of the, you know, were you getting older, more tired? Where like the fighting, was that coming less and less? Or you didn't really have the desire to do it? Yeah, the, um, yeah did it wear on you? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 did, it did a bit. It did a bit. But the, 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 the skill level in the game was starting to increase. And my, my skills were tapped out. Like I was, I was what I was. I wasn't going to be a better stick handler or better skater or anything like that. It, it was what it was. And, uh, and I remember calling Lindy Ruff. Lindy, Lindy went on to play. I don't know if the Rangers were his last, I think they were his last team. Yeah. So I, I was, you know, you get, you have these afterthoughts. You think, yeah, I wonder if I could play one more year. I wonder if I could, if, I wonder if there's anybody out there that could, so I called Lindy up. I said, Lindy, don't bullshit me. You know, you know my skill, my level. Can I play another year? Nope. I said, okay. <laughs> that's, what, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. He was just straight up honest with me, and I said, perfect. That's yeah, well. You got thanks, a. F- you Lindy, have a few but, tucks um... in here. You do have a few goals. Did you prefer scoring a goal or fighting? Oh, I'd rather score a goal, but they yeah. went up right. I had to get on the ice to do that, Jim. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's the best feeling when you score a goal. It helped the team in another way, right? I, you were I absolutely. You were good. I, you, 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 you contributed a hell of a lot more in the goal scoring. And, and well, you're a defenseman too. Playing. Like, come on, think yeah. about Tim. Think about. I'm telling you right now, Tim. You wouldn't go near the fucking net if Larry's standing in front of it. You'd I didn't go near the I didn't go near the net in 2013. <laughs> what do you have? Of course I wouldn't. <laughs> but not with not with Larry there. That's for sure. Um, pull him back. He used to you know, like cross check him in front. Yeah, of with this is the wooden sticks too. It's just like oh man, yeah. I can only yeah, imagine. You, you could beat up. <laughs> so I and I sincerely mean this. And you said it earlier. Not winning a Stanley Cup and play with guys that didn't and certainly I play with Marcel in New York and stuff like that. Know a lot of guys who haven't won one. Um and it does it hurt me? No. But when I look at guys who play the game and gave everything they had and they never get that opportunity, um yeah, I, I honestly I do. I feel bad for guys who never got that opportunity to be part of a team that did that. And a lot has to do with timing. Right. And where you drafted, when you drafted and what your team is like, who's coaching. There's so many variables that go into it. But looking at that and having not won a cup, when you look at your career, what for you was yeah, like your biggest thrill in playing the game? You, you, well, you... I grew up in Fort St. James, 2,200 people. When I was 10 years old, a guy named Brian Spencer – uh, went spinner. on to play. Yeah, spinner. Went on to play yeah. for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And that gave me so much hope. And I, I said, if a guy from my hometown can make it to the National Hockey League, maybe I can make it to the National Hockey League. So that was kind of a goal that I set up for myself. And then Brian would come back to town every now and then. His brother, his mom and dad lived there. So he, he, you'd, you'd see him in town and stuff, and he'd come back. And, I, and I, it always allowed me to be reminded that I can do it. I can do it. And so then once I got on the path, you know, getting drafted was big. I don't know if I have a, a favorite moment. I mean, maybe playing in my first game, playing against my brother 
would, would have yeah. been a moment that mattered. But um, just just achieving the NHL was 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 a big deal. Um, cool. And, and you know, Chris, like I I, I envy guys like that, that have won a cup. But but everything you said about that is so true. Like it has to be the right spot. It has to be you know you're drafted in the right spot, right coaching. Teams got to all all those components come together. It's it's not an easy trophy to win. You know? No, it isn't. I, I remember the year you guys beat us in the playoffs. There, Scotty was coaching. You know, we I think it was the first round, uh, 83, 84 maybe. And you know, I'll never forget. Um, boom, out the door. You guys shit kicked us. Um, you won the seven player award with the Sabers, right? Most inspirational player. Uh, probably a lot of people don't from a personal note that's certainly something from the fan base and the, recognizing what you did for the organization and your teammates yeah, I, I think so and, and like you know I, we, we had a good group of guys I mentioned Mike Ramsey earlier he was a he was a great teammate Lindy Ruff I, I was I was lucky to have played with some wonderful wonderful guys you know both here and in LA and uh, and my fondest memories I think are are growing up here in Buffalo um, you, you mentioned the, the, the Dave Samico fight. There was a there was a game we played in Edmonton. Um, Lindy Ruff got in a fight. Mike Ramsey got in a fight. Shortly after, two minutes later, Mike Ramsey got in a fight. And when Rammer gets in this fight, and, and the, him and whoever he fought were barking at each other over the, the penalty box, I'm standing next to Samico. And he... I, and, I, and I yelled at whoever the, the flyer or the, the oiler player was. I said, why don't you shut the fuck up and sit down? <laughs> and so he turns to me and he goes, why don't you shut the fuck up? Oh. So they dropped, they dropped the puck and way him, him and I get at it. So in, in a matter of, I don't know, six minutes, all three, Mike, myself, and Lindy were all in the penalty box for, for, uh, for fighting. I mean, it was, we were, it was, you know, you're 20-something years old, three, four uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you're playing the national yeah. hockey. Better does it get. Yeah. Craziness. I'll tell you a story about Semenko. I fought him a couple times there, and I, you know, certainly a big man, really big man. I thought you were big. He's like huge and yeah. he got a head on him. Like, and God rest his soul. But I'm in Afghanistan. Okay. I went over to v- visit the troops. Yeah. And I flew with Stu Grimson. Yeah. And General Hillier, we flew from Kandahar to a forward operating base to visit some other troops. And we're out there and we had lunch and we're talking to guys and he was giving somebody a bump in rank and giving them an a, award. And we're all outside getting ready to hear the general speak. And all of a sudden someone pushes me from behind and goes, hey, I turn around. He goes, hey, stop picking on my brother. And it was Dave Semenko's brother. He was in the Canadian Forces. No and he shit. was as big and as mean looking as Dave oh Semenko was. Oh I couldn't believe it. He must have had a flashback. It, oh, it was unbelievable. <laughs> but like, and it's crazy. And, and he was driving from that base back to Kandahar. And all I could think, and I said a prayer for them. Honestly, because all I could think, they're driving back through an area where there's nothing but IEDs. And that's all I could think when he, he he was pulling away. You know, we said goodbye. He was such a great guy. Really, it was fun to talk to him. And they really appreciated us coming there to um, to visit them. So it was a pretty cool story. But um, you're back in Buffalo now. Um, well, back in Buffalo. You never left after you retire. But... You did a little work in the um, uh, in the booth, right, uh, with Rick, didn't yeah. you, for a few I, years? Yeah, and, yeah and, know, that was nice. That was a nice transition from the game uh, coming out of the game. Some guys do, and they have to do a cold turkey. You know, they play the game and then boom, you're done playing. And so yeah. for me, to be able to work in the in the in the play by play or color man for Rick Jenneret was was a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. I what guess, was the hardest yeah. part about? What was the hardest part for you about commenta- uh, doing that play by play? You know what the hardest part, Tim, was to be honest. Like, t- t- if you're gonna if you're gonna be a, a good color man, you, you got to be able to say things that might not be complimentary on your on the team you're covering. 
even though you're, you're paid to be a homer, so you but, but you also got to be honest. And that, that for me, that was the toughest part. Was I, I had a tough time because the kids didn't shit the bed on their own. Like they, they didn't mean to have a bad game. They didn't mean to cough up the puck. Or they didn't mean to, you know, let three or four goals in. They just did. And and I didn't have a good way about me of, of describing that. So yeah, it was. But you know, I, when I when I got to Buffalo. I was probably three, four years in here and, and I got into some real estate, commercial real estate stuff. And that, that carried me on through after, you know, after I was done playing and, and finished up with the, with the uh, radio broadcast, that, that, that kind of carried me the rest of the way. And, and it's, it's, it's been a good way to make a living here in, in Western New York. And, and I've, I've been blessed, you know, you treat people right. I, I, I get so many breaks. I've gotten so many breaks over the years from contractors or warehouse stores or whatever. Just yeah, yeah. You spend five or ten minutes talking about hockey, but at the end of the day, you you get taken care of. It's 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 been a it's been a good experience. Let me say that. Well, good for you for taking advantage of that. That's a good thing, and and people do they they want to connect with uh, the former players, current players. They can't get near. So I guess the. The, the former guys, uh, certainly, uh, they, they're more available, put it that way. I, I just want to go back quick. What did yeah. you say? What did you mean by you didn't have a good way about you as a color man? Well, were you just too honest? I, I knew, I, I knew I wasn't, I knew I wasn't doing the fans any favors by not calling it the way I saw it. No. I, I was, I was, and, and you have to have a little bit of bullshit in you if you're going to be a good color man. You you, you do, but but I found that, it, that that the more I did that, the more it blackened my soul. And I said, yeah. I, 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 I I can't do this anymore. And so that's 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 no, what I just feel. Good for you for being. Yeah, honest it had to be like yourself, uncomfortable, please. right? Like it's like being like you're kind it, of it was, against, like you're, it, it was, yeah. It's, it's crazy uncomfortable, and and there's some people that are really good at it, and and you can you can listen to them, and they're being sincere. I I I, I wasn't that. I, I maybe I just wasn't a good bullshitter. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and then you have a hard time doing that. Call a spade a spade. I hear you, no question. Um, but uh, now are you still in charge of the Leafs alumni? I mean the Leafs, Sabres, the I, Sabres I, alumni. I, no, I, I I'm not. I'm still I'm involved a little bit, but I'm not in charge of it. And what I do now, as far as working for the team, is I help with the Sabres Foundation um, and oversee the. the there's a, we have a junior saver program here that is everything from a, an Ontario Junior Hockey League team is our U20 team all the way down to nine year old kids. There's a there's a group at each level, and I'm involved with that. And I'm involved with the Sabres Foundation, where our biggest thing that we do on the fundraising side is we raise money at the at the Sabre game, home games for with the 50-50 raffle. And I, I brought that on board about 15 years ago to, to raise money for the junior program. Oh, good for you. Always um, certainly been there in that community, a part of the fabric of that city, no question about it. And it's always good to get back. I think that's so cool. Um, you're still there and you're part of that. Uh, how's the new ownership? You're, you're great with the, the team and the alumni and, we, we, we were blessed, Chris, because we went through a couple of ownership ownership hiccups, and then Mr. Pagula bought the team, and and he, he and his wife came in, and and just it was just a, such a good feeling that you knew, okay, we're in we're in good hands. They're not going anywhere. We're we're going to be fine. And uh, and then we got Kevin Adams took over as the general manager, and and uh, and he's got himself a really good coach. So I think right now, right now the team. You know, I'll, they start off 0 2. I think they're in a good spot. <laughs> yeah, they got to. Real, real quickly, clear, I no got to ask. I got to ask. Quickly, I want. Yeah, I yeah, got a real quick go question. Ahead. When you were in LA at that time, did you catch yeah. any. Did you go to any Laker games? Was it crazy times with the Lakers? It was, and and, and I did. Um, and, and the one year that I was there, they won They won the. Uh, there was a. There used, Tim, there used to be a hotel right next to the uh, forum. And. My wife and I were flying out the next morning back to Buffalo and uh, the Lakers won the 
championship that night. And we, we, I was watching it on TV, but I was looking across the parking lot at the at the uh, forum. And when they when the when the game was over, the parking lot, everything went. It was just nuts. But yeah, I was there for that championship for sure. Uh. But I don't know, and I forget his name, and I'm going to kick myself in the ass for it. But back in the day, there was a Buffalo kid, high school hockey player, got paralyzed, playing at the odd. Um, and he was a huge Sabres fan. And I was in town. I was suspended. And I was in town. There was an article in the newspaper about it. I went and visited the kid. Ron DeWald. Ronnie DeWald. Now, uh, Ron DeWall was a huge Sabres fan. And I asked him when I was there, I said, you know, you like to, he said, I'd love to see the Sabres play in Montreal. And he was in a wheelchair. Anyway, we arranged it for him to come to Montreal. And his name is Ronnie DeWald. Uh, I'll never forget the kid. And what a nice boy. For playing high school hockey, f- fell over, kid went into the boards, paralyzed from the waist down. But, um, what a good kid. He, we got him to Montreal. He flew up with his parents. We put him in the hotel and, uh, wow. I'll never forget that kid. I, geez, I wish I, I could connect, reconnect with him at some point yet. Um, and see how he's doing in life. A terrible thing that happened to him, but, um, yeah, that, that was my connection to Buffalo. Wow. And, um, <laughs> the, uh, chicken wings, uh, Sinatra. <laughs> yeah, what a, so what a good. spot, huh? Uh, so just, yeah, <laughs> the little one back in the day. We used to go in. I love that play. They had we, the best. We, we right, they hard- had one next door. Right, they had Sinatra's and then yeah. Sinatra's My Way. Right, what happened there? I don't know, but uh, but but uh, but I I we're playing Hartford one night in in the arena, and I'm I'm staying at the hotel as well. They, that's where they put the call ups, and Bobby Hall played that night for Hartford. So now I'm in the bar afterwards. And it was that place was so small you had to go outside to change your mind, right? It was really yeah. Small. yeah. And and, and uh, I asked the bartender. I said, "Can you do you have a pen? I want to get Mr. Hall's autograph." So I, I went up next to Bobby and I said, "Mr. Hall, I played against you tonight. Would you mind signing?" And he did. He signed it for me. It was so cool. Oh, right. And then another Buffalo mo- moment. We're in the hotel lobby uh, in the morning. Uh, we get up, we come down, we're going to get on the bus, and who's checking out? Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was a mess. He was hung over. His hair was everywhere. He's not the thing. He's walking around like a nut. And we all met him. He's hey boys, hey. It was funny, the Rodney. But listen, Larry, um, I want to thank you for taking the time, pal. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, it's been fun to catch up. And Thanks you're a checking. good man. And Thanks I mean that. Um, uh, I mean that. Uh, all the bouts we had and stuff. I love meeting guys that I fought, guys that played the game uh, similar. It just um, and you're doing impressive. Well. You're you're doing well. You look great. Yeah, I'll back. You know, I I went through. Oh, my he was little... talking to me. He was talking to me. Chris. <laughs> you, you look great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, let me let me um, let me rephrase that. You look Asian, Tim. <laughs> okay yeah that's well i am <laughs> i know you love that I do. um i do i appreciate it though you're, you're again you're a good man i pre- appreciate you coming on and i'm well, glad you're have, doing well there in buffalo for you, but thank you for for catching up it was good to catch up with you bud well one no i forgot one thing i i, I always forget this because I, I get wrapped up in thinking about what i want to ask next but if um, you are, if you have to write your own eulogy, what would it be? Whoa. <laughs> the first line. First line? Yeah, you don't have to give me a paragraph. But first he, line of your eulogy. He did everything he wanted to do. There you go. Love it. There you go. There you go. That's I awesome. Did, I did almost everything. I didn't win the Stanley Cup, but everything else I wanted to do, I've been able to do. That's awesome. Hey. 
Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Raw Knuckles podcast. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe.